I like to start off every meeting lately that says, I've only been here for eight weeks, so uh, just to manage expectations, but it's been a great eight weeks, and uh, I'm delighted to share a word of hope and a word of uh, love with you tonight. As he entered the Starbucks that he frequented almost daily, a man by the name of John Kralik saw his usual barista, Kimber, working feverishly behind the counter. And when it came his turn, Kimber said, Happy Thanksgiving, John. What can I make for you? John ordered his usual beverage, and as he paid, he gave Kimber a small thank you card. Kimber was busy, of course, and so she put it in her pocket with the intention to read it later when things slowed down. Now, that card was the 260th card that John had written that year. Why so many? Well, to understand, we need to go back to New Year's Day of that same year. John had gone out for a hike, and he was feeling at an all-time low in his entire life. For you see, at 52, John owned a law practice, but after investing countless days and nights in this practice, he found that he was actually losing money. As a result, he didn't have the funds to pay his employees their Christmas bonus, and his firm was about to lose the lease on their office. Add to this that John was recently recovering from divorce, and he was living alone in a cheap apartment. Now, even the most hopeful aspects of John's life at the time were deflated. You see, the woman that he had been dating broke off the relationship suddenly just a day before Christmas, and a million-dollar jury verdict that his lawyers had won had just been nullified by a judge's ruling. Needless to say, it was not a good year for John Kralik. So hoping to clear his head on this New Year's Day and maybe escape some of the worry and the anxiety that he felt, John set out to walk up the Echo Mountain Trail in Pasadena, California. And while he was hiking that New Year's Day, John had a life-changing experience that he describes this way. I heard a voice I did not recognize. Wherever it came from, it didn't seem to come from me. And it told me that I needed to learn to be grateful for the things that I had, rather than focus on the things that I wanted or the many things that I felt I had lost. John shares that it was then that he suddenly had this idea of writing one thank you note per day for the next year. So at a time when John felt anything but thankful, he embarked on this journey to write 365 thank you notes that year. And you know what? It totally transformed John's life. Because for the first time, John saw that he had been blessed in so many wonderful ways. John shares that something even more subtle occurred too. Because through his thank you notes, he was trying to tell people how much their kindness meant to him. But as they responded, he started to discover that he was getting kindness and love and appreciation back. And in turn, he was becoming even more grateful. Later that Thanksgiving day, during a break at Starbucks, Kimber opened that note that John had given her earlier. And here's what it said. Knowing that you had to work on Thanksgiving of all days, I thought I'd express my gratitude that you've taken the time and made the effort to learn my name and greet me each day in a way that makes me feel like a person instead of a number. It's a small thing, but on any given day, it can make all the difference. Thank you. Now, John says that when he went back into Starbucks the next day, Kimber told him, nearly breaking down in tears, that his note made her realize that what she does really matters. It was his 260th thank you note of the year, and from that day forward, he vowed to continue until he reached day 365. And friends, I'm happy to tell you that he did reach that number. It took him a little bit more than a year, but he finally did. And John would say that his circumstances have improved immeasurably since that hike. He says, I'm now in great shape. I ran a marathon to benefit leukemia research in part to thank an employee. And then he did two more. 
He found a small but lovely house, and he was appointed to his dream job as a circuit court judge. Having now written his 860th, 860 thank you note, he had this to say, I can say that I keep learning that gratitude is the path to the peace that we seek. Gratitude is the path to the peace that we seek. Well-known theologian, theologian, professor, and author Henry Nouwen had these insights to offer. Perhaps nothing helps us make the movement from our little selves to a larger world than remembering God in gratitude. Such a perspective puts God in the view of all life, not just in the moments we set aside for worship or for spiritual disciplines, and also not just in the moments when life seems easy. The choice for gratitude rarely comes without some real effort. But each time I make it, the next choice is a little easier, a little freer, a little less self-conscious, because every gift that I acknowledge reveals another and another until finally even the most normal, obvious, and seemingly mundane event or encounter proves to be filled with grace. He says, acts of gratitude make one grateful because step by step, they reveal that all is grace. Friends, I'd like you to notice that John Kralik didn't start off with an attitude of gratitude. And maybe that's where you find yourself tonight. Maybe your life is filled with stress or worry, pain or disappointment, or maybe even grief. And the very thought of practicing gratitude may seem so foreign right now. I can tell you that I've been in that place. When my father died in a house fire or when my firstborn son passed away 10 years ago, gratitude was the last thing on my mind. Loss and heartache, sadness and pain, these were the things on my heart and mind, not gratitude. Oh, and let's not forget the well-meaning family and friends who would quote that scripture about being thankful in every situation. What's that southern expression? Bless their hearts. <laughs> While their intentions were good, their timing was not. And I felt all the more alone and isolated because I didn't feel like jumping up and down with gratitude, having just gone through these life tragedies. So friends, how do we develop an attitude of gratitude? Well, for me, it starts by remembering. Remembering who I am and whose I am. Remembering that I am a child of God who is loved unconditionally. Remembering also that in my anxiety, in my worry, and in my pain, in my heartache, and in my disappointment, and in my grief, that God is present in those moments. God is present in our joys and in our struggles, and we are never alone. Remembering the words of Paul that Pastor Greg read earlier that said, I'm absolutely, I'm absolutely convinced that nothing living or dead, angelic or demonic, today or tomorrow, high or low, unthinkable or unthinkable, absolutely nothing can get between us and God's love for us. Nothing. So friends, what I want you to hear tonight is the truth that no matter what you've experienced or not experienced, no matter what you have done or not done, what you have said or not said, you are loved by God. Amen? Amen. When I pause to remember God's grace covers a messed up person like me, I am humbled. When I pause to remember that in the midst of life's storms and tragedies that God is present with me and promises to never forsake or abandon me, I am hopeful. And friends, when I pause to remember that God's love for me is unbreakable and unshakable, I am thankful. When Mrs. Klein told her first graders to draw a picture of something that they were thankful for, she wondered if they might struggle with this assignment. After all, her school served one of the most economically and socially disadvantaged neighborhoods in our country. To her surprise, each student started to draw right away as she gave the assignment. 
As Mrs. Klein looked around the room, she could see some pictures of toys, some of parks, one of the sun, and a couple of family pets. And then Mrs. Klein noticed Douglas's drawing. Now you see, Douglas was timid and shy and was most often to be found kind of hiding in the shadows at recess, sitting by himself at lunch. And as she looked closer at Douglas's drawing, she could tell that he was making a hand. That's interesting, she thought. As the children finished their assignment and started to look around at what the other classmates had drawn, they too noticed Douglas's drawing. In fact, some of the children started to discuss whose hand it was that Douglas had drawn. I think it's a farmer, said one child, because they grow the turkeys. I think it looks more like a firefighter's hand because they help us, said another child. I think it looks like my mom's hand when she's about to spank me, said one of the <laughs> oldest classmates. Soon it was time to move on to the next activity, so Mrs. Klein collected all the drawings to hang on the wall. But later that day, after the other students were working on one of their other projects, Mrs. Klein went to Douglas and asked him about that hand he had drawn. Douglas quietly said, it's your hand, Mrs. Klein. She stood in silence. My hand, she asked. Douglas just shook his head yes. It was then that Mrs. Klein remembered how Douglas would often hold her hand to feel more comfortable during lunch and to feel safe as he went out to recess. You see, Mrs. Klein never really thought much about it until today. As she reflected on it now, she realized how Douglas would get upset if she wasn't there to hold his hand. Now, usually at a story like this, we would applause and celebrate Mrs. Klein, right? She's a great teacher, caring and compassionate. And while those things are true, tonight I'd like to celebrate Douglas. Because it's Douglas' expression of gratitude that made a life-impacting change on this teacher, Mrs. Klein. Whether he realized it or not, Douglas' expression of gratitude enabled Mrs. Klein to see this situation, this circumstance, through new eyes, through a new lens, some might say. Something that really had not meant anything to her before now was very precious because she realized how much it meant to this little boy. Friends, this leads me to the truth that I have discovered and I would share with you tonight that practicing gratitude may not change our circumstances. Practicing gratitude, however, can change how we and others experience those circumstances. Let me say that again. Practicing gratitude may not change our circumstances, but it can change how we understand and relate and experience those. And friends, that can make all the difference in the world. Amen? Like a muscle in our body, I am convinced that gratitude is a skill, is a practice, is a habit that can be developed and grown through practice. Just ask John Kralik or the countless others who have become grateful by intentionally practicing gratitude one moment at a time. Tonight, I believe there's no better place to practice gratitude than as we prepare to come together to this communion table. Now, you each should have received two thank you notes. One of these thank you notes is for you to use later this week, okay? And not just on anybody, but I would like you to be uh, looking for somebody in your life that seems to go unnoticed. Maybe it's somebody in your neighborhood who kind of is a recluse. Maybe it's somebody who you meet at the Walmart or the Starbucks. Find somebody who otherwise would go unnoticed in your life and offer them this thank you note. Will you accept this challenge? Okay. We'll use the second thank you note tonight to, in essence, practice showing gratitude to God. In a moment, you'll have a minute or two to write to God about something that you're thankful for. And then as you come forward to receive communion in a little bit, you can place the card along with your offering into 
a basket that we'll have up here in the front. Now, let me acknowledge that for some of us, this will come very naturally. And for others of us, this may be hard. If you find this exercise to be difficult, here's what I would want you to know. No matter what season of life you're going through, I believe there is something that you can be grateful for this evening. Perhaps it's one of those powerful truths that we talked about earlier. Perhaps it's that you're a child of God. Perhaps it's that God is present with you in your struggles. Or perhaps that nothing can stand in the way of God's love for you.